We heard that Richard might have been doing some mercenary work in Africa. But his passport doesn't show he ever went there. <laughs> Let me put it this way. Souza laughed. When we went to Africa, I didn't even have a passport. Rick knew ways to get in and out of the country that were undetectable, even to the State Department. Would you talk to me about Rhodesia? Well, let me first start by telling you Rick would have objected to the word mercenary. Now let's get this straight. Did Rick throughout his life get paid to fight in numerous conflicts around the world? Damn right he did. But he always picked his battles, and he never allied himself with any government or system that he felt was against the interests of the United States. And he fucking hated communism. If the Russians or Chinese were sending advisors or soldiers to some corner of the world, Rick would want to be there to oppose them. He told me that the oldest profession in the world and the true prostitutes were mercenaries, men for hire who would kill indiscriminately for money. Forget the soldier of fortune romantic lore about young men going off to the foreign legion and seeking adventure. That's not reality. The reality is most mercenaries are hired to do the dirty work, the butchery that a professional soldier won't do. Now, I'm not talking about private military firms or contractors, executive protection, or even the knuckle-draggers. Knuckle-draggers? Knuckle-dragger was a term we used to refer to any independent contractors who were paid by the CIA to do field work. The guys I'm talking about were the ones with no loyalty or morality, who would switch sides in the middle of a conflict just as long as they were offered more money. When Rick and me went to South Africa, we were recruited by a private military firm. They offered us a cash signing bonus when we landed in London, but Rick wouldn't let me sign any contracts until he went in-country and checked it. We landed in Cape Town, South Africa. Man, what a beautiful country. It's truly breathtaking. We were supposed to start a 30-day adaptation training once we landed, but Rick had other ideas. That week, Rick met up with some other Green Berets that he served with in Nam, and they gave him the real skinny, okay? He found out that a lot of the private military firms over there were scamming guys out of money and not paying what they were promising. And the equipment and uniforms they provided were used and in poor condition. Also, most of the company executives, who didn't even have a fraction of the experience of Rick or these other Green Berets, were the field officers and supervisors, and they wouldn't relinquish their power to anyone else. So we turned down all the offers and flew to Rhodesia on our own dime. Now Rhodesia was just as beautiful as Cape Town, but the landscape was more virile, untamed. Rick had contacts in the Rhodesian SAS, and he ended up getting us hired directly by the Rhodesian army as advisors. He even negotiated our contracts. We were initially hired on a six-month contract, which included all kinds of compensations, like if we got wounded, hospitalized, or killed. We also received danger pay any time we operated outside of our base camp. As soon as we signed our paperwork, they handed us bottles of Camaquin. Camaquin was a drug that supposedly stopped the biggest killer in Africa, which was malaria. The first thing Rick did when we got into base camp was to talk to some of the top trackers from the Celis scouts. The Celis were the special forces of the Rhodesian army that basically handled all the clandestine missions. See, Rick was already a master tracker. However, he was now playing on a new ball field. He wanted to learn everything he could about the terrain, weather, foliage, and animals in the Rhodesian bush. The next thing he wanted to see was what type of footwear the gorillas preferred. Many expert trackers will keep books that include hundreds of detailed drawings or pictures of shoe soles. Remember, I was never a soldier, but I was a weapons expert and gunsmith. I could also competitively shoot with any man back then and still to this day. So I always worked with Rick on teaching him about the parts and nomenclature of hundreds of weapons, and he would teach me about soldiering. When we'd head out to the Everglades, Rick would teach me dozens of things to look for when you're tracking a man. He'd always start with the terrain and atmosphere. He'd just stand there and tell me to observe all the sights and smells. Now, if the sounds change or stop, it's an indicator that someone is or was recently in the area, okay?
Then he'd start looking at the smaller things, like spider webs, to see if they were recently broken. He'd look for bent or broken blades of grass. If it was bent, then the direction of the bend would indicate which way your subject was going. And if the blades were broken, they would only stay green for about a day after they were damaged. He'd have me look for rocks that had recently been overturned. You could easily spot them because the rocks will have the darker side facing up. The darker and damper the rock, the closer you are to the enemy. He also taught me techniques on how to defeat someone tracking you, to make sure you walk on the hardest ground you can find, and utilize rivers and creeks whenever possible, to try to take advantage of rain and inclement weather to hide your track, to try to wear the same footwear as your enemy to confuse him. When traveling on soft terrain, remember to always brush out your tracks with palm fronds or ferns. Last and most importantly, always booby trap your trail to slow and discourage pursuit. Now, getting back to Africa, let me first give you a little history lesson about what was really going on over in Rhodesia. You can't believe everything that came out of Walter Cronkite's mouth back then, and the newspapers were all running stories about Rhodesia being this rogue, evil nation of white minority rule that was oppressing the blacks. But that wasn't true, and I'll tell you why, okay? Because Rhodesia, which was isolated by the world with import embargoes and surrounded on all sides by enemies, should have fallen in a couple of years, not lasted over a decade. The problem the nationalist groups calling for a majority black rule had was they didn't have the support from the people. The first rule in any guerrilla war is the majority population must support the conflict. Africa has always been an unstable continent ruled for God knows how long through a tribal hierarchy. There were just too many blood feuds going back hundreds of years that wouldn't be ended by someone just handing them democracy and saying, Good luck, boys. Have at it. The reason the majority of black Rhodesian citizens backed the minority white government and voluntarily fought in the military was because they were safer and their standard of living was higher than any of their neighbors. It wasn't a perfect situation, I get that. And of course they wanted more rights, but they were more interested in their children's future than immediately seizing power. The plan was for a much slower transition to a majority-led black government, but the world had different ideas. So here comes old Russia and China again to back the nationalists' movement and provide them with weapons, funding, and training, okay? The tactics were the same guerrilla tactics taught to the Viet Cong that Rick and those other Vietnam vets over there had already seen. This was never a conventional war with big battles. There never was a front line. Neither side had much in the way of air power, and the helicopters and planes were mostly used for supply and reconnaissance. Rick and I mainly stayed in the base camp to provide training to the new recruits, but I do know on a few occasions Rick just couldn't help himself and snuck out with the troops on search-and-destroy missions. Every day you'd hear about a bus hitting a landmine, or a bomb planted in a petrol station being detonated. Like the VC, they had very crude base camps. They built no military infrastructure, and they never attempted to occupy territory. The year I was in country, there were increasing incidents of Rhodesian farmers living on the outskirts being horrifically slaughtered by the guerrillas. The commander of the guerrilla army, Robert Mugabe, would quickly denounce the attacks and state in the press that those were just rogue terrorists, but we knew different. There was a family that me and Rick met that owned a farm just outside Bulawayo. Bulawayo was the second largest city and sat closer to the border of Botswana. We had swept the area once and met all the local landowners to talk about security. This one family had invited our entire squad in for lunch, very lovely people, and the farm employed maybe 20 of the locals. The guerrillas waited that night until we left the area and then slaughtered every man, woman, and child on that farm. They shot the owners of the farm and their family execution style in the back of the head. But the black employees were brutalized in unspeakable ways before they were killed. They chopped off several of the children's heads and stuck them on the ends of a Segai spear tips. 
the guerrillas were sending a message to the local population that if they worked or cooperated with the whites, they would be seen as traitors and treated as such. The next day, after we heard the news, our entire squad wanted to go into the bush after them, but the commanders ordered our unit to stand in place as security for the other landowners in the area. Rick wanted to go in alone, but two other crippled eagles, who also wanted revenge, defied orders to go with him. Crippled eagles? That was the informal name of the American Vietnam vets that served in the Rhodesian Army. These were the men that also had their careers shortened by the reduction in force, and the name Crippled Eagle was a dig at the country for betraying them. Rick and the Eagles were gone for 11 days. Most people were writing them off, but they finally made it back. They carried Rick on a makeshift litter, and he was hospitalized for a couple of weeks. Was he shot? No, he was running a high fever and had infections all over his body. He himself never told me the story of what happened. I got it from the other two American soldiers. They told me by the third day of tracking, they found the guerrillas' base camp. It was a pretty well-defended camp with fencing and guard posts containing approximately 17 of the guerrillas. The two soldiers wanted to immediately hit the camp, but Rick made them wait two more days so he could observe it and come up with a plan. On the sixth night, Rick inserted himself into the camp by crawling through a small creek and up a dugout dirt trench that ran under the fence, which the guerrillas used as their latrine. There was a sentry nearby, and he was watching the outer perimeter, not guarding the water supply, which was stored in five-gallon steel gasoline cans in the interior. Rick poisoned their water with some type of concoction he made from pieces of rotting dead animals mixed with animal droppings and gun-cleaning solution. Rick and the men then waited and watched the camp for another full day. By the next day, half of those guerrillas were suffering from some form of severe dysentery. That night, Rick crawled back in through the same shit trench and laid in that foul muck. He carried flares, grenades, and a 22 caliber high-standard semi-automatic pistol fitted with a silencer. It's a real quiet weapon, but it has almost no stopping power so you need to get really close to the enemy for a clean headshot to put him down. The other two Americans carrying Belgian FNFAL rifles placed themselves in firing positions high up in sturdy trees that overlooked the entire camp. Rick killed two guerrillas that came by the ditch to do their business. The first guy was a clean headshot. Rick quickly pulled the man's body into the muck and waited for the next guerrilla. The next man wasn't a clean kill. A nearby gorilla heard the dying man making noises and sounded the alarm. The most important part of Rick's plan was to set flares off inside the interior to create a well-lit shooting gallery. Rick quickly threw out several flares in all directions, then tossed a grenade to cover his back as he hauled ass out of there. By the time he got back to his own firing position, which was maybe only a minute or so later, the fight was already over. Three or four of the gorillas escaped into the bush, but the rest were ground up by those FAL rifles. With the camp illuminated and half the guerrillas so sick they were barely able to run, it was like shooting fish in a barrel. They did interrogate one wounded man and got some good intel. The day after the attack, as they were making their way back to our camp, Rick started running a high fever and collapsed. It's obviously never a good idea to lie in a pool of shit when your body has hundreds of small cuts and bug bites from traveling through the bush. When they did finally get back, all three were in pretty rough shape from lack of food and water, with Rick, of course, being the worst. The Rhodesian commanders understood that they were thankful for what Rick and those crippled eagles did, but they also had to make an example out of them for disobeying orders. The two eagles who were sworn into the Rhodesian army were fined a month's pay and sent back to the capital in Salisbury. Rick was already on thin ice with Rhodesian high command because a few weeks earlier he'd bumped heads with a major general. But Rick was too valuable to not be utilized. So instead of sending him home as soon as he got out of the hospital, they sent him off to Angola to continue as an advisor. I stayed on as an armorer for the next Rhodesian light infantry for an additional six months. Did Rick ever talk to you about Angola? The next time I saw Rick was maybe a year and a half later in Miami, and no, he didn't talk about Angola, but that was Rick. 
The other thing I remember when I first saw him back in the States was he looked... different. How so? Just a different vibe. He had a malaise about him. Let me put it this way. I knew two different Ricks, okay? There was the guy I knew from the gun store, and he was a fun guy, and he knew his shit, but he was kind of reserved. Now, that guy in Africa was a totally different guy. In the jungle and in combat, leading men is where Rick belonged. It was what he was put on this earth for. His eyes would blaze, his focus was laser sharp, and he had a whole different vibe, you know? Can you describe that vibe? Killer. He was a stone-cold killer. See, that guy in the world was a part of Rick, a part of the Renaissance guy I told you about. But Rick wasn't whole until he was in the jungle. Does that make any sense? See, to be honest with you, all those stories and things you heard about Rick sounded good and cool. But maybe they were just stories. You know how people talk. So you never know how a man really is or was in combat when you're just shooting the shit in a coffee shop. But Rick was all that and more. It's kind of like seeing a wild animal at the zoo. Their eyes are kind of dull, and they just don't seem as dangerous. But if you'd encounter them in their environment, it would be a whole different ball game, buddy. You could bet on that.